Russian citizens and Ukrainian citizens united against Putin. Russian citizens, whom Russian leader Vladimir Putin has resettled in the regions annexed by Ukraine, have started protesting in the Donetsk region. With the decrease in trust in Vladimir Putin due to the coup attempt in Russia, Russian citizens who were sent to the territory of Ukraine want to return. Putin, who wants to suppress attempts at rebellion, has declared a state of emergency in Donetsk, sending the Russian National Guard to the Donetsk region. The operations of the Ukrainian army in the occupied Donetsk region have exhausted the patience of the people of the region. But the most striking part of the job is that Ukrainian citizens also supported the rebellions started by Russian citizens living in Ukraine. The Russian dominance in the Donetsk, Zaporizhia, Kherson, and Luhansk regions, which were occupied by the Russian army in the first months of the war, still continues. Although the Ukrainian army continues its operations against the border, towns of these four regions, control over the urban centers is still in the hands of the Russian army, as it is known. Vladimir Putin announced that he had annexed these four regions by holding an illegal referendum in these regions. Although Putin's annexation decisions are not accepted by any country, Vladimir Putin claims that these territories now belong to Russia. When Putin's annexation decisions were not accepted by foreign states, Vladimir Putin launched his second plan and began sending tens of thousands of Russian citizens to these annexed regions. Putin's main goal is to organize a legal referendum in these four regions when the war between Russia and Ukraine ends, and to win these referendums, thanks to the Russian citizens he has placed in these regions. This strategy implemented by Vladimir Putin had been progressing successfully so far. But the change in the course of the war and the shaking of Putin's authority due to Yevgeny Prigozhin began to make Russian citizens living in these regions nervous. While the war between Russia and Ukraine is ongoing, the fact that a coup attempt occurred in Russia and the Ukrainian army is now conducting special operations within the borders of Russia has begun to drive citizens living in these regions into fear and panic deck. Russian citizens settled in the Donetsk region by Putin agreed to live in these regions because of regular salaries and promised lands every month. However, with the Russian economy entering a turbulent period, there have been disruptions in the salaries of Russian citizens living here. Although this situation has made Russian citizens extremely bored, the point that has exhausted the patience of Russian citizens has been the operations of the Ukrainian army in the Donetsk region. The Ukrainian government wanted to take advantage of Prigozhin's crew attempt and move to retake the Donetsk region, which has been under Russian occupation since the beginning of the war. Aware that the Russian troops fighting on Ukrainian territory are in a weak period, Zelensky launched his first operation in the Donetsk region. The Ukrainian army, stationed in the city of Kramatorsk, a city quite close to the Donetsk region, began to fail to improve their operations with long-range missiles and done manned combat aircraft to important buildings of the Russian army, such as the command center in the Donetsk region. The Ukrainian army carried out an air operation late at night, launching an attack on a military headquarters in the Donetsk city of Makievka. The long-range missiles fired by the Ukrainian army from the city of Kramatorsk in Makievka hit the Russian headquarters in Makievka with the missiles hitting. A big explosion occurred at the headquarters, and the darkness of the night left its place to light due to the flames that appeared. According to information obtained from regional sources, it is said that more than 210 Russian soldiers are stationed in Kara. However, it is not known how many Russian soldiers were killed or injured as a result of the operation. The missile hitting the fuel tank located at the headquarters increased the intensity of the explosion even more, and the sound of the explosion could be heard even from miles away. However, this latest operation by the Ukrainian army has enabled Russian citizens living in the region and Ukrainian citizens to unite against Putin. Due to the fact that the Ukrainian army has carried out three different air operations in the Donetsk region in the last two days, Russian citizens living in this region have led Vladimir Putin to think that he cannot ensure the security of the Donetsk region due to the fact that Wagner's troops captured cities within the borders of Russia in just one day. The trust of the Russian people towards Putin had decreased, increased considerably the loss of control of the Russian army fighting on the territory of Ukraine after the internal disturbances in Russia makes the Russian citizens, whom Vladimir Putin has sent to the annexed regions very annoying. 
Thousands of Russian citizens living in the Donetsk region took to the streets and began to organize protests for the end of the war. Russian citizens who expressed that they did not want to die for Vladimir Putin began shouting on the streets that they wanted to return to the borders of Russia. The number of rebel Russian citizens whose numbers did not exceed a thousand in the early morning reached tens of thousands within a few hours. However, the most interesting event was that Ukrainian citizens living in the region also supported these protests initiated by Russian citizens. Tens of thousands of Russian and Ukrainian citizens united and began organizing anti-Putin and anti-war protests on the streets of Donetsk. Russian soldiers stationed in the region could not intervene decently due to the presence of Russian citizens among the demonstrators. However, with the growth of the rebellion and the reflection of this event on the world agenda, Vladimir Putin began to deploy Russian National Guard soldiers known as Rosgvardia to the Donetsk region. Thousands of National Guard soldiers have been sent to the Donetsk region. The National Guard, which is tasked with suppressing the riots here, has been sent on an expulsion mission for the first time with the increasing size of the rebellion. The protesters gathered around the Donetsk governor's building. The Russian governor, appointed by Vladimir Putin, could not leave the building because the building was surrounded by demonstrators. The Russian governor, who stated that a state of emergency had been declared in the region, announced that he had resigned, unable to withstand the pressure of the demonstrators any longer. The regional governor stated that he had declared a state of emergency in the region before terminating his mandate and that they needed the support of the Russian government to suppress the protest. With the growth of events in the region, armed rebels who introduced themselves as the Free Donetsk Organization began to appear. The members of the organization, who were quite numerous, consisted of both Russian and Ukrainian citizens. A masked member presumed to be the leader of the organization addressed the protesters, gathered in the area and made a statement. In his statement, he stated that they will continue to fight for Ukraine to regain full independence and that they have taken over the administration in the Donetsk region for now. According to information learned later, it turned out that the Free Donetsk organization has been continuing its activities in this region for a long time and has been secretly supported by the Ukrainian government. It was announced by the leader of the organization that the vast majority of sabotages carried out against Russian forces in the Donetsk region were carried out by members of this organization. Shortly after these events, Russian government officials claimed that the U.S. administration had been secretly supporting this organization for a long time. According to the statements of the spokesman of the Russian Foreign Ministry at the request of the United States, a number of officials from the Ukrainian Defense Ministry held a secret meeting with members of this organization. During this meeting, it was promised that the Free Donetsk organization would be provided with military equipment and ammunition. Jewel, there has been no response from the U.S. administration to these claims of the Russian Foreign Ministry. Yet while the protests in the Donetsk region were continuing, the most interesting event happened when the Ukrainian army intervened in these protests. The Ukrainian army wanting to take advantage of this internal confusion in Donetsk organized simultaneous operations on two border towns in the Donetsk region, wanting to take advantage of the weakness of Russian forces there. As a result of the ground operation in the towns of Razivka and Blahadayton located on the border with Donetsk, the Russian forces there were completely repulsed. The Ukrainian army regained control by liberating these two towns from the Russian occupation in order to show their support for the ongoing protesters in Donetsk. Thanks to the capture of these two towns by the Ukrainian army, two different supply routes to the Donetsk region have also come under the control of the Ukrainian army. The Ukrainian army has divided a battalion of about 4,200 soldiers that had had been hibernating in the Donetsk region into two different units. These two troops carried out a simultaneous ground operation on the towns of Morozovka and Blahadate, which were side by side due to the fact that there are not many Russian troops in the towns. The Ukrainian army successfully carried out this ground operation after hours of clashes. The Russian soldiers stationed here began to leave the towns unable to resist the Ukrainian army's offensive any longer. Interestingly, this operation, carried out by the Ukrainian army led to the formation of a new movement in the city center where the protests continue. With these operations, the Ukrainian army has shown its support for the protests in Donetsk, 
thus enabling the Ukrainian and Russian citizens who are rebelling to take action as well. Demonstrators who took to the streets with torches and sticks in their hands continued to give the National Guard soldiers sent by Vladimir Putin a hard time. Even the thousands of National Guards sent by Putin could not suppress these protests taking place in the region. Putin has recalled some of his troops from Ukraine to Russia's borders due to the coup attempt in Russia. The remaining Russian soldiers continue their duties in certain regions of Ukraine. For this reason, the Russian government cannot send more troops to suppress the rebellion here. Putin, who has been tried for war crimes he has committed before, is aware that the international criminal courts will come into play again if he intervenes harshly against citizens here. For this reason, he cannot take a harsh intervention against the protesters. The growth of the rebellion and the resumption of sabotage attempts by members of the Freedonets organization in the region again began to annoy the National Guard sent to suppress the rebellion. Members of the organization blew up a Russian ammunition depot in the Donetsk region in a sabotage attempt which led to the formation of a large explosion in the region. Even the protesters were surprised by the impact of the explosion. The National Guard's men sent to suppress the uprising initially thought that this explosion was an attack by the Ukrainian army. For this reason, some of the National Guardsmen who wanted to save their own lives began to leave the area. However, this explosion was carried out by members of the organization in the region. In fact, the vast majority of Russian soldiers sent to the territory of Ukraine also do not want to die for Vladimir Putin. But out of necessity, they continue to fight on Ukrainian territory. The Chechen leader, Ramzan Kadyrov, known as a close friend of Vladimir Putin, stepped in again because these ongoing protests in the Donetsk region could not be suppressed. Kadyrov, who recently sent some of his soldiers to Russia to support Putin during the coup attempt organized by Prigozhin, now wants to send Chechen soldiers to the Donetsk region in the same way. Chechen leader Kadyrov announced that the troops he had sent inside the borders of Russia to prevent the coup would be sent to the Donetsk region. It is expected that the Chechen contingent, estimated to be close to 1,000 in number, will reach the Donetsk region soon. Vladimir Putin is forced to fight the rebellions both within the borders of Russia and within the borders of Ukraine. These events have greatly shaken the authority of Vladimir Putin. After Prigozhin's betrayal, Putin must have been deeply shaken by the betrayal of his own citizens whom Putin had sent to the territory of Ukraine. But Putin made many promises when sending these citizens to the territory of Ukraine, and now he is unable to fulfill any of these promises. For this reason, Russian citizens forced to live in Ukraine are quite right to hold these protests. In addition, these citizens sent by Putin have no means to return. Russian citizens brought to these regions by military vehicles and buses have to request a vehicle again to return. But since Putin has forward-looking plans, he would never want Russian citizens here to turn back. While the protests are continuing in the Donetsk region, the situation is not good within the borders of Russia either. Although Putin has banned protests within the borders of Russia, many organizations still continue to protest in secret. Instead of taking to the streets and shouting, these undercover protesters are taking to the streets late at night, spray-painting writings and leaving signs in certain areas of the city. You can see inscriptions such as Putin resign and no to war on the walls of many metro stations and buildings in Moscow. But what Putin should really be afraid of is that Russian soldiers fighting for Putin in Ukraine will mutiny. As it is known, Russia's entry into an economically turbulent period has also affected the Russian soldiers in Ukraine quite badly. We hear on the news that Russian soldiers fighting in Ukraine often make the decision to lay down their weapons. The reason why these soldiers decided to lay down their weapons is that the Russian government does not meet the basic needs of these soldiers. Recently, a minority of soldiers in a unit serving in the Luhansk region decided to lay down their weapons, stating that they were not provided with a enough provisions and ammunition and had to be fed one meal a day. Although Putin is trying to prevent the spread of these news within the borders of Russia, the world's press is sharing these news. Following the insurrection in the Donetsk area initiated by Russian and Ukrainian residents, Russian troops stationed in the region began to lay down their arms, drawing courage from these rebellions. The war between Ukraine and Russia took a completely different dimension after the NATO summit in Vilnius. Actors in the international, political, 
diplomatic and military arena signed historic decisions during, before and after the NATO summit in order to eliminate Russia's threats in Ukraine and in important maritime areas. At the very beginning of these decisions, there were surprising developments about Sweden's NATO membership process. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan announced that his country supports Sweden's membership with a surprise announcement the night before the NATO summit. With Erdogan's support, Sweden could join within weeks. This move by Turkish leader Erdogan came as a huge shock to Russian leader Vladimir Putin. In fact, with Erdogan's decision, Putin's concern was not only in the political arena, but also about the impending danger in one of the most important sea areas, Kaliningrad in the Baltics. So why did Putin panic so much about Kaliningrad? Russia's Baltic fleet near Kaliningrad is the most strategically important class of Putin's naval forces. Potential rivals and enemies in Russia and Europe rely on the Baltic Sea to import and export large numbers of goods. The Baltic Sea region has thousands of ship crossings each month, with the 2018 report measuring 3,500 to 5,500 per month. Both of the sabotaged Nord Stream pipelines cross the Baltic Sea and the Russian naval base in the Kaliningrad enclave is the only base that faces the Atlantic and is ice-free all year. Russia has invested heavily in the defense of this region in recent years. As a result of these investments, Russia's naval power on the Kaliningrad coast developed. Currently, Russia's Baltic fleet in Kaliningrad has 52 ships, including modern submarines, and Russia has planned six upcoming Lada-class advanced submarines for the Baltic. Despite the ongoing hostilities in Ukraine, Russia gave priority to the Baltic Sea and kept most of the ships, missiles and planes allocated to the region at home. And of course, Russia continued to conduct a large military naval exercises here. So Russia has vital interests in the Baltic Sea, and everybody knows it. But as we mentioned, the situation in Kaliningrad offshore, in the Baltics has completely changed with Sweden's accession to NATO. Turkish leader Erdogan has agreed to support Sweden's bid to join, paving the way for strategic change in this once Moscow-dominated region. Once the agreements are ratified, Sweden will become NATO's 32nd member and hand over 2,000 miles of Baltic coastline to the alliance. This is a terrible situation for Russia. This is because the participation of Finland and now Sweden means that Russia's only non-NATO country with a sea border has also joined the International Military Alliance. This not only means that the Baltic Sea is a NATO lake, apart from a few Russian diversions, it also means that NATO has new crossing points where it can monitor Russian submarines and other ship traffic. Sweden's participation in the alliance, in other words, means significantly expanding NATO's border with Russia, strengthening defense in Northern Europe and making the alliance's deterrence more credible. Now, any ships or submarines leaving St. Petersburg will have to pass between NATO members Finland and Estonia. In fact, since both Tallinn and Helsinki are in the Gulf of Finland, Russian ships will now have to pass within 20 miles of the two NATO capitals. In addition, the situation seems to worsen for the Russians as the ships leave the bay. The Danish straits are already quite narrow and the three main passages through these straits were completely under NATO control with the participation of Sweden. The only remaining cross over the Ersund or the Sound will also be entirely under NATO control. In short, because Denmark and Sweden have road connections across the narrow straits, it's now impossible to cross the Atlantic from St. Petersburg by ship or boat on the water without going under a NATO bridge. Russia's Baltic fleet had already gone through a difficult transition when it needed to go anywhere. This fleet is largely located near St. Petersburg and in the Kaliningrad enclave. By the time he left St. Petersburg for decades, he had to cross the narrow waters between Finland and NATO member Estonia. A resurgent NATO is poised to tighten its control in the Baltic Sea by complicating a vital gateway for Vladimir Putin's navy in Russia's backyard. So what was Russia's reaction to this situation? Speaking at the alliance meeting in Lithuania, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov stated that Russia would respond to NATO's increasing size amid the possibility of Sweden joining. Lavrov's statements to Russian state media followed Turkey's decision to withdraw its objections to Stockholm's membership on the, the first day of NATO summit in Vilnius. The Russian minister reported that Moscow was surprised at the speed with which Finland and Sweden abandoned their neutral status. 
Lavrov reported that they had taken sufficient steps in NATO's enlargement long ago. Russia also warned against the possibility of Ukraine joining NATO, which was an important topic of discussion at the summit, according to RIA Novosti. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov stated that Ukraine's NATO membership would be very dangerous for European security, and those who would make the decision should be aware of this. Under Article 5 of the NATO Charter, an attack on one member is deemed to have been done against all members, and if Kiev joins, breaking the ceasefire with Russia and Ukraine could lead to a direct conflict between Moscow and the alliance. For this reason, some NATO members advocate that Ukraine join the international military alliance after its war with Russia is over. However, the Kiev administration had stated that the initiation of Ukraine's membership in NATO would be a way to end the war started by Russia and that the Ukrainians were expecting concrete results from the summit in Vilnius. In fact, Ukraine deserves to be a NATO member. The time has passed for assurances that the door to NATO is open. These should be translated into decisions that will initiate the accession process. But for Ukraine to join NATO, the right moment must be waited for. Since the war is still going on right now, it doesn't seem logical for NATO to confront Russia or for other NATO alliances to be affected by this situation. But Ukraine doesn't want to waste time on this issue. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky recently made a striking tweet about this. Zelensky demanded that Kiev have an appropriate accession calendar. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has been calling on his North Atlantic Treaty Organization allies to extend his country's membership for months. Indeed, NATO was formed in 1949, in the aftermath of World War II, to embody a peacekeeping alliance between the United States, Canada and several Western European countries against the growing Soviet threat. NATO members have committed to helping their allies if attacked by a third party. Perhaps more than anything else, the Ukrainian president hopes to get into this intergovernmental body. As Zelensky rightly believes, that the manpower and weaponry that NATO allies can provide will effectively impede Russian forces far from delaying membership. Of course, perhaps the most important weapons in Ukraine's arsenal today, including Western main battle tanks, Javelins, HIMARS and the Patriot defense system were supplied by the United States and NATO allies. Zelensky expressed his gratitude for the frequent aid packages provided by the West. The Ukrainian president, however, is currently expressing his disappointment at Biden's insistence that Kiev is not ready to become a NATO member. Obviously, Zelensky should press for his country to join NATO because it would be in Ukraine's interest. But as we mentioned, it's not the interest of the United States for NATO to face this situation in a kinetic war with Russia to defend foreign borders. Perhaps this general consensus between U.S. lawmakers and the White House will change over time. But for now, Zelensky must consider the colossal ramifications of moving NATO directly into the battlefields. Therefore, waiting for the right moment for Ukraine's NATO process seems to be the only option. All eyes are on the small war-ravaged city of Bakhmut there in the Donetsk region of eastern Ukraine. One of the most fierce battles of the war is currently being fought as Russia seeks its first major victory since its summer capture of the cities of Severodonetsk and Lysychansk. Although Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky described the situation on the front as very difficult in his speech to the citizens of Ukraine on Sunday evening, Russian forces have not yet surrounded the city. If Moscow's aim is to seize Donetsk and Luhansk by the spring, then capturing Bakhmut could be an important step in the eastern move. However, the Russian forces have so far been unable to advance beyond the city's outskirts and disrupt the crucial ground lines used to supply the Ukrainian forces in the city. After months of morale raising Ukrainian victories largely supported by Western weapons, the tide of the war changes once again. Unlike the Russian forces, the Ukrainian armed forces managed to deal a shocking blow to their arch rival in Bakhmut. The last day, the soldiers of the State Border Guard Service of the Ukraine shot down Russia's Su-25 aircraft over Bakhmut in the Donetsk region. It is reported that Russian Su-25 aircraft protected the infantry, advancing in the defensive line from the air. The fighter planes were supposed to attack ground targets, but the portable anti-aircraft missile system entered the destruction zone of the operators after the Su-25 jet was hit, it crashed to the ground and caught fire. 
The fate of the crew is still unknown because it is not possible to approach the crash site of the attack aircraft since it was actively shot down. According to preliminary data, the aircraft was commanded by a spotter and as soon as it passed over the man pad's operator, an anti-aircraft missile system was fired at him. Due to the loss of thrust in one of the engines, the attack aircraft fell to the ground and crawled about 100 meters on its belly, after which it caught fire. After the Russian Su-25 fighter jet was destroyed near Bakhmut, Ukrainian border guards shot down a Moscow Army unmanned aerial vehicle in this region. The Ukrainian army hit the target of the Russian occupying troops with small arms and the UAV was destroyed by the border guards. In the past 10 days, many Russian fighter jets and drones have been shot down by Ukrainian air defense units in Bakhmut. In the current chart, we see that the Russian Air Force is completely trapped in Donetsk and cannot fly. As can be seen, Bakhmut, the key name of the Eastern Front is becoming an important region where both countries exhibit their struggles. Both Russia and Ukraine are struggling to gain momentum here with the recent gains of the Ukrainian border guards. The name that is close to gaining positive momentum seems to be Kiev. Do you think Bakhmut will fall and what will happen if it does? Let's talk about this possibility in detail. We continue to assess that it is unlikely that Bakhmut will fall anytime soon through the Russian encirclement. That's a bad prediction for Putin's larger territorial ambitions in the region. Bakhmut fall would be a modest tactical victory for Russia. However, given all the resources used, it would also be a Pyrrhic victory. Indeed, Western officials are reported to have estimated the number of Russian soldiers killed or wounded in combat so far, approaching 200,000, which was estimated at just 80 0 I in August. In recent months, the Russians had to spend enormous resources and reserves to take Bakhmut. In this regard, Ukraine's plan was successful. While the loss of Bakhmut is symbolically damaging for Ukraine, which does not want to cede any of its territory to Russia, it is almost certain that it will not have a meaningful impact on Kiev's war effort. Even if Russian forces advance towards Sloviansk and Kramatorsk, they will encounter another Ukrainian defensive line, which is even more fortified. It took eight months for Russian forces to advance from the occupied Papazna in Luhansk Oblast to their current position in Bakhmut. One conclusion is drawn from the rate of advance of the Moscow army. Bakhmut will be nothing but a months-long conflict of torment and attrition. The real question for now is this what's next? Ukraine's Western allies continue to stockpile weapons and supplies for Kiev, most notably their decision to procure awful new battle tanks and armored vehicles. Many Western experts say that tanks especially can give Ukraine an advantage over Russia's old tank power, the T-72 and Ukrainian officials fear the stalemate could turn into an attrition that favors Russia's larger economy and larger population. This means that Kiev is willing to demonstrate its ability to make quick battlefield gains and gain more territory if the West's patience wears off and its wallets shrink. But if repeated warnings from Ukrainian officials are correct, Russian commanders are also eager to prove to the Kremlin that they can still triumph on the battlefield. Besides the Russian commanders, the Wagner Group still retains its place among those eager to achieve success in Bakhmut. So what is the Wagner Group's interest in the fight over Bakhmut? The Russian paramilitary group commands some 50,000 fighters deployed in Ukraine, along with conventional troops. The vast majority of these are believed to have come from Russian prisons. While the mercenary group has so far not played a widespread role in the Russian war effort, it is credited with inflicting Kiev's first major territorial loss in months. With the recent capture of the salt mining town of Solidar, just nine miles north of Bakhmut, showing military success may be politically necessary for the Wagner Group, especially for its leader, Yevgeny Prigozhin, one of the war's most visible leaders. Its visibility is in part thanks to its frequent video commentary on the Bakhmut war on the messaging app Telegram, which highlights the role of the Wagner Group and at times even contradicts the Russian Defense Ministry's own statements. Wagner's role as a proxy combat force was fully demonstrated at the Battle of Bakhmut, where its mercenaries were tasked with wearing down the Ukrainian defenses before an attack by more conventional Russian troops, including Moscow's elite VDV Airborne Force. 
The Wagner Group offensive on Bakhmut really culminated after they took Solidar. But the Wagner Group has not really made any significant progress since then. It's estimated that at least 4,000 Wagner mercenaries were killed and 10,000 wounded in Solidar and Bakhmut. In addition, many reports of the Bakhmut war published within Russia praise the Russian offensive and exaggerate its success and importance. However, we covered the Bakhmut battle in detail above. When we look at the current situations, it is not possible for us to share the same ideas with the Russian media. It looks like the eastern front lines in Bakhmut will continue to be one of the key points of the Ukrainian war in the coming days.